Our speaker this hour told me that he was Rolf Ruffner. <laughs> he said he only wished. Brother Ruffner was supposed to be speaking at this hour, but because his father passed away, uh, he has gone to uh, there to be with uh, the family, and I believe the last that I heard, at least, uh, the funeral was supposed to be tomorrow for his father. So I called up Brother Stulting and asked him to speak on this lesson, the subject of Daniel, the third chapter, if, but, will. He said he might be able to get all of his material in now that Brother Green preached half of his lesson. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I know that he's going to have some good material for us. Uh, Stulting and his wife Sue have three children and 11 grandchildren. His son uh, had some difficulties that uh, was rather well known uh, or widespread and they prayed about it. We mentioned it here and had prayers for his son. And last I have heard, he's still doing very well, improving. He preaches for the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas. Uh, works with one of the other speakers this week, uh, Lane Blake. So uh, they get to torment the brethren there. I mean, <laughs> We appreciate him. I, I kind of wonder, though, how he is going to be able to get through a lectureship uh, lesson without his wife's uh, cell phone going off. Um, it seems like it happens all the time, but uh, I know that he's going to have some good information for us and deliver a great lesson to get here to him. I noticed that he started my timer before he introduced me. I don't know if there's any significance of that or not, but uh, yes, my son is doing a lot better. The latest on him, um, in fact, I just got a picture on my cell phone from my wife. She is here in spirit, still trying to interrupt. I had it on vibrate, so she didn't interrupt anything. But uh, my son was able to walk into the church building to worship this morning, and that is a big improvement over uh, what his health has been. The only thing is, last Wednesday, uh, he had some pain and he went in. turns out he's got kidney stones in both kidneys. And the doctor said, this too shall pass. So, uh, he's in for some more pain, uh, the way it looks, and excruciating pain. I know that uh, that's not anything to uh, minimize. Uh, another thing I'd like to say, I'm, I stand before you as a gospel preacher primarily from the effort of one man, Roger Barron. Uh, Roger was an excellent gospel preacher, taught me a lot, not only from the Word, but also by his example and through his encouragement. And I stand before you as a gospel preacher because of Roger Barron's effort. And just want you to know, some of you know him. He passed away uh, early yesterday morning. And he certainly as far as I'm concerned, will be missed. And those that knew him know him as a sound, faithful gospel preacher. And uh, he sure will leave a void in the brotherhood. Uh, certainly would like for you all to pray for the Baron family in this time of their difficulty. I feel like a guy I knew back when I used to do mechanic work. He was a vegetarian, and one day he brought a watermelon, a half a watermelon, and that was going to be his lunch. And he put it in the refrigerator so it would be nice and cold. Well, somebody came in there with a big long knife and cut the heart out of that watermelon and ate it. And needless to say, when he got there, he was disappoint disappointed. And uh, Brother Green cut the heart out of my watermelon. He said, I only used seven verses. And I said, well, that's like a fourth of the 30 that I had. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, the background of this lesson, we're all familiar with chapter 3 of Daniel. Uh, if you've been in the church very long, taught vacation Bible school, it seems like every year they try to work Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into vacation Bible school material. And uh, with good cause. 
because they are such a great example of youth and how youth can make a difference and stand up for the truth and live and do what's right. And we need to encourage our young people. Brother Green made a great point. This is not a children's story. This is a story about faith under fire. This story really begins back when they were living in Judah. Because they lived in a nation, according to Jeremiah, that was rebellious. And according to Ezekiel, when Ezekiel was given uh, his marching orders to go out and preach, he says, you're going to a rebellious people. Not only are they rebellious, but their fathers are rebellious, and they've been rebellious, and they're rebellious to this day. They were rooted and grounded in rebellion and unwilling to repent. And all those that had gone before to try to straighten out this nation had failed because of the hardness of their heart. In fact, they were described as, as being backslidden with a perpetual backslide. I don't think you get worse than that, folks. And, and this is the, the background out of which these boys came. Daniel and his three companions. They came out of a nation that had turned their back on their God. But yet they, in that setting, had chosen to be faithful. And then, lo and behold, here they are, taken out of their homes taken out of their country, out of everything that's familiar to them, and put in a foreign setting, and yet they still remain true to their God. How many of us, when things go badly for us, are willing to turn our back on God and blame Him for our misfortune? We see that time and time again. When things bad happen, folks, that's the time we need to turn to God and to our brethren and associate with those of like precious faith so that we can be built up and exhorted and encouraged in our difficulties. And we see this in chapter 1. These four boys stood together. And they stood together even in a situation in which many would have capitulated and just went along with the crowd. But they stood up and they were blessed. Because they stood up and did what was right. And as Daniel, I mean, as Brother Green pointed out, they were blessed with special wisdom and knowledge, and Daniel with the interpretations of dreams. And in chapter 2, he uses that ability. And he was put into a position of authority in this foreign country in which they found themselves. But. He asked that his friends also, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their, their pagan names, by the way, he asked that they be put in positions also, and, and that was granted them. And so because they stood up for the truth, they were blessed, but at the same time, it's evident from our text that they made some enemies, because we know the story, don't we? We know how Nebuchadnezzar, after the dream was interpreted, and, and he found out that, you know, this big statue that he dreamed about with the gold head, and, and Daniel said, you're that head. You're that head of gold. You're the, the greatest nation. You know, it kind of makes me wonder if he didn't get a little prideful there. We know later on in the book that, that he's punished because of his arrogance and pride, but, but in this chapter, in chapter 3, and I wish I had time to read it, but we got 30 chapters and uh, 30 verses and I think a little over an hour and a half to preach this. And, and we're, just, we're just not going to have time to read the whole chapter, but we're going to refer to it as best we can. Here we have in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar setting up a statue, 90 foot tall, 9 feet wide, about the size of a, about the height of a nine story building in the plain of Dura. Now he set it out in the plain, and we know that the plains are the flatlands, and so it could be seen from miles away. When the sun would hit it, since it was covered with gold, it would shine and gleam and be beautiful and attract the attention of everyone in the area. You know, some people, the commentators and, and those that look into these things often wonder what the statue was representative of. And some would believe that, that it would be a statue of their god Marduk. And, and some would believe that it may be a representative of the statue in his dream. But I believe that it was a representation of Nebuchadnezzar himself because of his pride and his arrogance. That he wanted everyone to look at him as 
God-like. And so when, when the time came and they were going to dedicate the statue at the dedication, the dignitaries from all over the empire are gathered. We don't know why Daniel's not here. He's not listed among those. This is about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were all brought together, important men from all levels of government. And this would, of course, include these three young men. And a herald is sent forth. And instruction is given. The herald goes among the crowd and, and he cries out. And, 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 and at the sound of an orchestra, he says, when you hear the music play, then you're supposed to bow down. Everyone is expected to fall before the image and worship it. And if that's not enough, he gives extra incentive. He says, if you don't do this, then you're going to be cast in the furnace of punishment and burnt alive. Now this is, this is what they were faced with. What would you do? What would you do if you were in this position? Now we know, according to the law of Moses, that worshiping of idols was forbidden. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 7. In fact, in chapter 7, verse 4 and 5, we see the punishment for those that would even dare to bow down to an idol. It says, For they will turn away thy sons from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. That's what ought to happen with false gods and idols and with those that worship them. And these boys knew that. They were aware. They were familiar with the law of Moses. And they understood that if they bowed down even at the threat of death, if they bowed down and worshipped this idol, that they would incur God's wrath. And they just weren't going to do it. You know, they could have reasoned. The nation of Israel has been destroyed. God has forsaken us. He's let us be taken captive. In fact, when Ezekiel goes in, and uh, rebukes the nation, they accuse God of being unfair and unjust. The ways of the Lord are not equal, they say. And they could have reasoned and, rationed and, and been rational this way. And said, well, since God has forsaken us, what's He going to hurt to bow down to this idol? Well, they didn't do that. They might have said, you know, we'll bow down to this idol, but inwardly we're going to know it's wrong and, and we're not really intending to do that. But we're going to do it. We're just going to go through the motions, you see. And let everybody think. And that way, we won't violate God's law and we won't violate this law and, and everybody will think we've done what we were commanded. They could have rationalized it that way, but they didn't. You know, as emperor, when we think about this, they could have said, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is the emperor and he has the right to command us to do whatever he wants. And it sounds kind of like uh, Romans chapter 13 where it says we need to obey the, the magistrates, those that have rule over us. But this is one of those times when the government has asked a God-fearing person to do what is wrong. Now, friends and brethren, there are laws on the book. Uh, Brother McClish spoke very eloquently last night about abortion and how that that's legal and, and those things. But we're not forced to do that. What if we were in China and we were only allowed to have one child and if we conceived another one, then we had to what? We had to abort that child. See how that would work? How many people would stand up and say no to that? See, friends and brethren, we live in a country where we're blessed to where we don't have that many laws that we have to choose. You know, if I'm going to obey this law, I'm going to disobey God. We're not put in this position, are we? But you know, suppose one day they make it against the law to speak out against homosexuality. 
See, they're already trying to make mixed marriages legal. But what if they made that law? What would you do? Well, I know what I would do. The first time that my newspaper article come up, I would write on homosexuality. Now, I say that now in, the, in, in, in looking toward that. But then I'm going to go and I'm going to pray that I'll have faith and courage and commitment to live up to my beliefs. You see, we really don't know about what kind of commitment and courage and dedication to God we have until our faith is tested. And these boys were put to the test. Their faith was under fire. Friends and brethren, if, if you're a gospel preacher, a Bible class teacher, or a Christian in general, your faith is under fire every day. When you get in this pulpit, your faith is under, under fire. Are you going to teach the truth? Are you going to make application regardless of who's involved? And demand, and thus saith the Lord, not only from the pulpit, but from the lives of the members of the congregation in which you preach. And see, we have a thus saith the Lord by the way we live. These young men said, thus saith the Lord. We're going to live our lives according to the Lord's will. And we don't care what Nebuchadnezzar said. We don't care about his fiery furnace. We're going to do what's right. That was their faith. That was their courage. Notice the peer pressure. When the orchestra played, everyone did as the king commanded. The thought of our peers is one of the greatest hindrances of our faith. So many would rather make, or rather not make waves, even though they disagree with what everyone else is doing. I'm just not going to make waves. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go along to get along. Isn't that the hue and cry of today? With one's faithful brethren, they're going along to get along for whatever reason, and they've turned their back on the Lord. Peer pressure. It was what kept the rulers of Jesus' day in John chapter 12, verse 42 through 43, from confessing their faith in Him. They loved the praise of men rather than the praise of God. It is why people only whispered Jesus' name rather than shouting it from the rooftops. The Messiah is here. The Christ has appeared. John 7 and verse 13 it says, Yet howbeit no man spake openly of Him for fear of their... What? Fear of the Jews. They didn't want to upset the Jews and acknowledge the Christ. When we're put to the test... When these young men were put to the test, and I'm going to borrow this, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, and they wouldn't burn. When it came time when those trumpets blew and the music sounded and everybody else bowed to the statue except these three. You know, it's probable, probable that other Jews bowed down as well. It may be that everyone else, Jews included, bowed down and these three stood alone. Or it could be that these men were, were picked out and picked upon because of their leadership in the nation in which they dwelled. It could be that. But regardless, they stood out like a what thumb on a hand with no fingers. Friends and brethren, these men had courage. Their nonconformity was noticed by others. It was noticed. Friends and brethren, you can't go against the grain without being noticed. You can't go against the grain without someone speaking out and saying, Look at him, he's different. They're not doing what everyone else is doing. Friends and brethren, as Christians, we must be willing to be different than the world. Because if we're not different from the world, then we're no better than the world. And we cannot be pleasing to God. They wouldn't bow down. They were, they were reported. Somebody ratted them out. 
And with certain Jews, their names were given specifically these three men. And then when brought before the king, Nebuchadnezzar, they wouldn't bend. Their refusal to bow down was seen as defiance to the king and, and disrespect to the king's God and, and defiance of him, the king himself. Here we see Nebuchadnezzar's fairness though. You know, some people brought this report and he didn't just take their word for it. He investigated. He checked it out. He brought these men before him and he, and, and he questioned them. Is it true? And then he even offers them a second chance. He says, won't you bow down and worship this when the music sounds? Won't you just do that? And he reiterates the consequences. If you don't, it's almost like he's pleading with them that he doesn't want them to be cast into the furnace and he's giving them this second chance. He reiterates the consequences. And then he says, Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? See his pride, his arrogance again showing up. This is the one that just in the previous chapter was praising God above all other gods. But now it is, who is that God who should deliver me, or deliver thee out of my hands? Notice their boldness and courage in verse 16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, they're not afraid. They're not worried. They've got conviction. And we're not going to pick and choose our words wisely so that we can give an answer that won't give an offense. We're going to tell you like it is, whether you like it or not. Isn't that kind of the preaching that Paul demanded of Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort without long, with all, um, without? No, with all long suffering and doctrine. Be instant in season, out of season. Someone once said that means you preach it when they like it, and then you preach it even when they don't like it. And that's the answer that these young men gave to Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to answer you, but we're not going to pick and choose. We're not going to try to placate you with fair speech. Notice what they said. Their courage. Their willingness to be blunt with the king was based upon their faith in God. When we have faith in God, it will give us courage to say the right thing at the right time to the right people. And to say what needs to be said, even if it's going to bring hurt to ourselves. These boys knew what was at stake. They knew about that fiery punishment. Notice what they said, If it be so, our God whom we serve, he asked, What God will save you out of my hands? And they answered, If it be so, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and we will deliver us out of thine hand, O God. I mean, O King. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. This verse, the latter part of this verse, we will not worship thy God or serve the image that you set up lets me know that that's why I don't believe that this was an image of a God. Because he says we're not going to worship your gods nor serve this image. The image I do not believe was of their gods. I believe it was of Nebuchadnezzar himself. We're not going to bow down even to you. So they wouldn't bow when given a second chance and threatened again, they wouldn't bend. And then, when it was time to be thrown into that furnace, it says that Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He was so furious that he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times above what it normally was. Now, I don't know that they had a thermostat and if it was on a uh, hundred that they turned it up to seven hundred. I believe this may be figurative language and they they just turned it up hot enough to get the job done. 
That may be it. I don't know, but I do know this. That when they were bound with their clothes left upon them, maybe for kindling to help the fire. And the men, the mighty men, the strong men that grasped them and took them to throw them in the fire, the fire was so hot that just approaching the furnace killed them. And when those boys left the lifeless fingers of those men that were their executioners, and they fell among the, the fiery furnace, they were not forsaken. Nebuchadnezzar is astonished. He looks in there and he says, didn't we throw three people in there? Bound? How do we see now four walking around? Unbound. He says, God has sent His angel to deliver these. He said it was like as one that was like as the Son of God. There's a lot of a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion about who this first fourth figure was. Some people say it was an angel. Some people believe it was the pre incarnate Christ. Whoever it was, whatever it represents, we know that God put that figure there to save the lives of those three boys that demonstrated so very vividly their faith in God. He delivered them from the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar, again, astonished, said, Come out! He, he says, Come out of there! And when they came out, their hair wasn't singed. Their clothes weren't burnt. There wasn't even the smell of smoke about them. All those things that you would expect to happen to someone while they're in the fiery furnace, none of that thing, none of those things happened. They came out unharmed, unscathed. And friends and brethren, their faith was rewarded. Their faith was rewarded. The king and all the governor's officials which watched these men leave the flames were astonished. And Nebuchadnezzar recognized that only the Most High God could do such a thing. These men were right to put their trust in such a God, and God was right for overturning Nebuchadnezzar's decree. Nebuchadnezzar had asked these boys to do something that was unrighteous. And even if God had not delivered them, even if the fire would have consumed them down to the very ashes, their souls would have stayed in the righteousness of God. Even though they would have died, they would have died knowing that they died serving the living God. Even though they had given up their life, they knew that they would walk with Him in heaven. And the eternal reward would be theirs. That's the same faith that Paul had. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, What? I'm in a strait betwixt the two, whether to die, to depart, and be with Christ, which is very far better, or remain with you, which is needful. Paul didn't look at death as something to be feared or dreaded, but something that was better than anything this life has to offer. His final words to Timothy, The time of my departure is at hand, and I'm ready to be offered. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Why? Because he finished the course. He fought a good fight. He kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not for me only, but to all those that would love the Lord and His Spirit. These young men had that kind of faith. Jesus, on the Mount of Olives, Praying, Lord, if it be Thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thine be done. You know, these boys, their faith was, you know, God's, God can. He can deliver us from this fiery furnace. But even if He chooses not to, we're not going to worship. We're not going to worship your gods or serve your idol. Let's look at some applications. 
Nebuchadnezzar pride. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Some today may not be, be setting up a 90 foot idol, but they want to be remembered. Some set up idols of preacher training schools. Some people set up idols of network television. Some set up idols of publications and other types of works. And they so want those works to be remembered and then name, their name to be associated with those works that they will compromise the truth to make sure their work gets the money that it needs to survive and they don't care what they have to do by hook or crook to get that money to sustain that work. And as a result, all those good works that once were are no longer worthy of our support. And when they call upon us to bow down to those works and fork over our dollars to support those works, what should we do? We shouldn't bow. We shouldn't bend. And we won't burn. But I'll tell you what, friends and brethren, if we bow down, if we bend, if we give in, and we support those works, we will burn. There is a fire that is to be feared far and above the seven times heat of that fiery furnace that those boys were thrown into, and that's the fires of hell. And friends and brethren, if we give in and we give up, that's where we're going to go. That's what we have Facing us. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is better than some of my brethren today. He's at least willing to consider the evidence. You know, we, we have Dave Miller, false teacher, proven for years, false teacher, evidence CD that Brother Michael Hatch has put together. Available. Given away for free to anyone. But I'll tell you what, you think it's carrying bubonic plague the way some people won't touch it. And those that get it, they say, well, I have had two years to look at this and I haven't come to the right conclusion. I still haven't had time. I'll tell you what, I gave that disc to one brother in Christ. He asked me about Dave Miller and the current situation. Gave him that disc. They called me back three days later. So that man's a false teacher. He's a heretic. We ought not support him. Three days. With the right heart, the right attitude, people can understand the truth if they want to. But see, some people give up. Some people won't consider the evidence. And you know, even though Nebuchadnezzar got it wrong and he threw these boys in the fire, he... Considered that evidence too, didn't he? The further evidence. And he found out these men are faithful. And he changed, didn't he? He changed his position toward these boys, didn't he? They served. These boys that were nonconformists that wouldn't bow, wouldn't bend, wouldn't burn, whom I persecuted and tried to destroy. What would happen if other people saw these three nonconformists standing while everybody else is bowing? That might catch on. Some people might do that too. Do you know what the result was after he considered all of the evidence? Not only can these boys worship the God that they choose, so can everybody else. He reached the conclusion demanded by the evidence. Blessed be the God. Friends and brethren, we got people today that don't even have the sense of Nebuchadnezzar. Let's look at some lessons from Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Don't bow down under pressure. And we face pressure every day, folks. Pressure about money that we've already mentioned. Peer pressure. Gospel preachers, faithful brethren that we've known for years are turning from the truth. And there's pressure in that to cut them some slack. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have said, you know, if we just do it this one time and don't really mean it, it would be okay. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, have no fellowship 
with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's exactly what they did. And friends and brethren, if we go on and we fellowship those that are the unfruitful works of darkness with sin, we can have no fellowship. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say a little. It says have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. You know, there's a lot of things that there's no guarantees on in life, but one thing you can be guaranteed of, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're not suffering persecution, you might just be willing to ask yourself, am I living godly in Christ Jesus? Or if you observe some that are going along to get along, and everybody speaks well of them, Jesus says, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Maybe we need to look at their faith. One point I want to make before we give the invitation. We need to ask ourselves a question. We need to ask ourselves this question. Do I obey God or do I just agree with Him? There's a difference. You know, the farmer had, a, had, had, had some boys and he bought a piece of land and he drew a map of that land and he said, this is where I want the house, this is where I want the barn, I want the corral over here, and I want the well over here. The boys went over there, they built the house where the father wanted it, they built the corral where they wanted it, built the barn where they wanted it. But when it came to digging the well, they said, you know, if we put the well over here, it would be more accessible to all three of those things. And so they put the well where they wanted it. Did those boys obey their father? No. They obeyed Him as long as they agreed with Him. But when it came to something they didn't agree with, they went out on their own. And friends and brethren, I think that we've been blindsided by a host of what we once considered faithful brethren who never obeyed God. They just agreed with Him. And when it came to something they disagreed with, they went out on their own. Friends and brethren, we think about the fiery trials of our faith. When we give the invitation, our faith is tested. If you have sin in your life, it takes courage to get up among all these people, among all these witnesses, and walk down that aisle and acknowledge your sin. To say I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness. It takes courage to do that. Your faith is under fire when we give the invitation and you have sin in your life. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand up courageously and come to the front and acknowledge your sin? Well, you need to be baptized as an alien sinner. Put on your Lord's uh, in baptism and be added by the Lord to the church. Acts 2.47 and if you're a Christian and you have sin in your life, and the invitation is offered and you're commanded in Acts chapter 8 and verse 22 to repent and pray and acknowledge your sin as we see in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, do you have the courage to do that? Your faith is under fire right now today. And as Christians, we have tests of our faithfulness every day. If you're a faithful child of God, I encourage you to consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this great chapter of faith under fire. And never give up. Never give in. And never surrender. The invitation is yours if you'll come forward while we're standing.